Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in to week three of my mini movie review Oktoberfest thing. I'm glad you're enjoying the break from the norm. I am getting to review a lot more movies and crossing a lot of recommendations off my list, which was one of my goals. Of course, for every one I get to cross off, I seem to add two more, so I'm not making much progress, but that's okay. <laughs> Movie number one is a viewer recommendation, actually, 1977's Snow Beast. On the eve of a ski resort's 50th anniversary hoopla, a hairy bipedal monster makes its presence known by going after the skiers. This one has a bad reputation. I would say it's not terrible, but it's not a good movie. It's got a big cast, in a sense, by which I mean you might know all these actors, or none of them, depending on your perspective. Bo Svensson, Robert Logan, and Clint Walker lead the charge, along with Yvette Mumieux and classic film veteran Sylvia Sidney as the resort's stubborn owner. Nobody really stands out in an overwhelmingly positive way. Clint Walker is probably the most convincing and most likable of the three male leads. He seemed vaguely familiar to me, and I told my mom he looked like he belonged in a western. And later, I looked him up, and what do you know? This is one of the few things he was in that wasn't a western! Uh, he was also in The Dirty Dozen, which is probably what I know him from. I did find a bit of semi-relevant trivia about him. Clint Walker almost died in a ski accident in 1971 when his pole went through his chest and pierced his heart. Uh, he was initially pronounced dead at the hospital, but they managed to bring him back from the brink, and he was working again in a few months, and then went on to do this movie, where, if I remember correctly, he does do some skiing. Anyway, Snow Beast is fairly run-of-the-mill monster stuff, which is fine, I like monster movies, but it is bogged down with flat direction and some tedious scenes, and you hardly get more than a brief glimpse of the monster or its victims. And I thought that was pretty lame. Now I'm no glutton for graphic content, but the coy camera angles and the speedy cutaways made me feel like I was being cheated. When there's all this build-up to a reveal, and characters are looking at something off-screen and going, <gasps> I want to see what they're reacting to! <sighs> One of the better scenes occurs when the monster shows up at a school and causes a panic. When poor Sylvia Sidney gets knocked over in a stampede, that is the scariest, most distressing part of the movie. It looked like an accident, like she got bumped and fell down and they kept it in. I have no idea if that's the case, that's just how it appeared to me. Most of the film, though, is pretty bland, with a limp attempt at a love triangle and a monster hunt that runs out of steam too early. I'd say it's worth a watch if you're really into Bigfoot and Yeti, or if you're a fan of one of the actors, but I don't think it's ridiculous enough to be a rollicking good time if that's what you're looking for. Movie number two is an adaptation of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow from 1999. I can't just say that it's the 1999 version because that's also the year that Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow came out. This adaptation of Washington Irving's classic American tale is a Canadian production put out by the Hallmark Channel back when their movies had more substance and variety. This is the fourth version I've seen, after the Disney animated one, the Jeff Goldblum one, and the Johnny Depp one, and with all due respect to those versions, which have merits of their own, this is the one that most faithfully adapts the story. I reread it last year, I think it was last year, and so it's still relatively fresh on my mind, and I was astonished at how close this was. Brent Carver plays Ichabod Crane perfectly. He's an interesting character because I think you're supposed to feel sorry for him at the end, but he's really not likable except as a figure of fun. And Carver nails every gawky movement and mannerism. The preening, the wrong definitions of fancy words, the fantasizing about food, the outrageous dancing, it's all there in all its cringy glory. Even the loud singing, which Carver, a Tony Award winner, pulls off no problem. 
I liked how the community was portrayed as well. The earthiness of the people, the wives fawning over the educated schoolmaster while their husbands roll their eyes. Some of the line readings are questionable, with dubious early American accents, but a few of the supporting actors are really good. And while Rachel Lefebvre's performance as Katrina Van Tassel is a bit rough in spots, she looks just like the character should. As faithful an adaptation as it is, they did make some departures, adding scenes that flesh out Katrina and Brom Bones, which actually make them more likable. I was mystified by a bizarre change in the famous climactic segment, but the visuals in that part were great. The woods enhanced with eerie red lighting to make the arrival of the Headless Horseman even spookier. This was a hoot, and I did enjoy it. But you should be aware that most of it is a comedy about an awkward, social-climbing schoolteacher trying to woo the most sought-after girl in the county. This isn't a horror film like the Tim Burton movie, but Burton's Sleepy Hollow has hardly anything to do with Washington Irving's story, and Johnny Depp's more endearing portrayal of Ichabod Crane is nothing like the original character, whereas Brent Carver becomes him. Movie number three is 1967's The X from Outer Space, or Uchu Daikaiju Girara, a Japanese monster film in which repeated attempts to complete a mission to Mars have been thwarted, possibly by UFO attacks. The next team survives their trip, but they bring back a live specimen that turns into a rampaging monster. Two cult favorites, this and 1968's Genocide, both directed by Kazui Niyamatsu and produced by Shochiku, aired on Turner Classic Movies a couple weeks ago. I had never heard of them, and they seemed a little bit rare, so while they were available to stream until October 31st, I squeezed them into my already full schedule for the month. The X from Outer Space is categorized as a horror movie, but that's a technicality. It's very like the Godzilla movies of that era, though not as polished, which is saying something. Much of it is typical space adventure fare, but with a groovy twist. The tone tends to vary, as one minute characters are somberly discussing the loss of the previous crew, and the next they're teasing each other about impressing the lone female teammate. I'm not sure what purpose she really served on this mission, but I don't want to single her out because I found everyone a little loosey-goosey and unprofessional. It was odd, but maybe all the more serious, more qualified people died on previous missions and these are the ones who were left. The film features a creative ship and moon-based design, as well as a UFO that looks like a jellyfish. It's also got excellent jazzy music, doesn't always seem appropriate, but as the film progresses, it does a lot to liven things up. And that turns out to be very helpful, because the pace is kind of slow, and not much actually happens. So, if you were lured into watching this movie with the promise of a big goofy monster, which is certainly true in my case, uh, the way the first half of the film unfolds is somewhat underwhelming. Thank goodness the monster shows up when it does, because it saves the show. To a certain extent, this is another Godzilla ripoff. Only if Godzilla was a giant rubber chicken that shoots laser beams and has antennae flopping around on its head. I think my favorite aspect is that by nature of the design, no matter what's going on, it always looks like it's smiling. The monster is the best part of the whole thing, and that, along with some quirky choices and moments of unintentional humor, is probably what has earned this its cult status. I should emphasize, however, that, as is often the case with these kaiju films, there are two versions of this movie. From what I hear, the one some of you might have seen in your childhood, the bad English dub that has some totally wackadoodle things about it, is very different from the Japanese version. So if you're shocked that I didn't find this hilarious, that might be why. We're not talking about the same movie.
After that, my mom and I watched movie number four, 1968's Genocide, also known as Conchu Dicenso, which is about killer insects trying to wipe out the human race. I went into this with lowered expectations, since I wasn't blown away by the X from Outer Space, and if you remember a couple years ago when I reviewed Goku Body Snatcher from Hell, the plane crash vampire alien movie from the same studio, uh, I didn't love that either. <laughs> Plus, the synopsis for this made me think of the 1958 British movie Cosmic Monsters, which isn't that good. So, that's where my brain was. But Genocide was an entirely different experience. It really is a horror film, and it's far more serious than I anticipated, with more adult themes and a strong anti-war message. It touches on tensions between East and West, marital strife, biological warfare, psychological torture, all without any absurd-looking monsters to take you out of it. It stars Keisuke Sonoi, and what a good guy his character was. It was remarkable because we don't usually have one person who gets to play such a heroic role in these films. It's more often an ensemble of protagonists. They also did a good job with another character's arc in a particularly compelling sequence. Are there some things that are kind of strange? Concepts treated with the utmost solemnity that are actually a little silly? Moments that feel kind of goofy? Sure. But I would say they are few and far between. And fortunately, I don't think a viewer is likely to mistake the tone because it's clear from the beginning. And it is consistent through a surreal hallucination sequence, a few quick but nasty injury shots, close-ups of insects biting people that'll give you the creepy crawlies, and a shocking ending. This is much darker than The X from Outer Space, but to tell the truth, I liked it a lot better. So I don't know why they have the same low score of 4.8 out of 10 on IMDb. I thought this was a good movie. I don't know, maybe there's a corny wackadoodle dub out there that everyone watched in the 70s and 80s. Maybe it got the MST3K treatment, and that's what everyone rated. If that's the case, it seems awfully unfair. Movie number 5 is 1972's Endless Night, an adaptation of Agatha Christie's novel in which a young man and woman get married against her family's wishes. They set up a home together, but their wedded bliss is threatened by the interference of relations, friends, and ominous neighbors. This psychological mystery thriller stars Haley Mills and Highwell Bennett with Britt Eklund and George Sanders. One of its noteworthy features is Bernard Herrmann's music, a composition that is slightly reminiscent of his famous Vertigo score. In fact, this film does have kind of a Vertigo vibe. But it's also very early 70s. At times, it's pretty stylized and kind of artsy-fartsy, and to be blunt, I didn't like it. But I never really wanted to watch it in the first place, because Endless Night is one of my favorite Agatha Christie novels, and I was worried that, whether it was good or bad, the movie would supplant my memory and enjoyment of the book. I have known about this movie's existence since I was 12 or 13 and got that bathtub, bed, bedside bathtub armchair companion to Agatha Christie or whatever it's called, and I have hemmed and hawed over watching it for many years. Even as I was putting the disc in the player, I was hesitating and wondering if this was such a good idea. It's not that I'm so attached to the book. There are other Agatha Christie's that I like better. I would put this in my top 10, but there are several books ahead of it. But I tend to find adaptations of her work dissatisfying. Yes, there are exceptions. I like the 1945 and then there were none, despite the botched ending, and the 78 Murder on the Orient Express, and I enjoyed many a season of Poirot with David Suchet, though it got a little too modern in its final years. But there have been more that I didn't like, and a few that I found downright despicable. <laughs> and I have learned that the greater my familiarity with or fondness for the original, the harder I am to please. 
This movie was okay, the leads were well cast, though Haley Mills' American accent here still sounds incredibly quintessentially English. The story is a surprising one with strange twists and startling turns, and they did fine with all of that, keeping you guessing and slightly disoriented. I just didn't like the style of it. The way it was filmed, the way it was edited, some of the direction, the ugliness of the house, even certain hair and wardrobe choices. And then there's a sudden sex scene that comes out of nowhere. Sorry about that, Mom. <laughs> and that was another thing that felt very of its time. And that time isn't a period of filmmaking I particularly like. I am glad I don't have to wonder what the movie's like anymore, but I hope I forget about it, because I would like to reread the book again someday for the fifth or sixth time, and I don't want to be picturing this movie when I do. And movie number six is 2005's The Descent. Shauna MacDonald plays a woman still dealing with trauma from a car accident that killed her husband and daughter, who joins her five friends on an annual adventure getaway. They set out to explore a cavern in the Appalachian Mountains, trekking two miles below the surface of the earth. But when a passage collapses and cuts them off, they discover they're not alone down there. Last October, I watched writer-director Neil Marshall's Dog Soldiers, and since I really liked that, so much that I contemplated revisiting it this year, but I just don't have time and kind of maxed out on my werewolf allotment, I decided to nerve myself up to watch The Descent, also written and directed by Marshall. I've covered several films this month that aren't really horror movies, they've just got spooky moments or an eerie atmosphere, but this, this is a horror movie, and it's definitely not a kid-friendly one, with oodles of gore, guts, violence, copious amounts of blood, and one nasty protruding bone, not to mention swearing. And I happened to rent the original unrated cut, so who knows what grody stuff I got to see that was too much for the theatrical version. Remember last time I mentioned that 28 Weeks Later has an eyeball thing that was almost too gross for me? <laughs> this one has an eyeball thing too. <laughs> What really impressed me with this film is the way they shot the scenes in the cavern, which is where the bulk of it takes place. These are cramped, unlit spaces. Ergo, it's difficult to photograph actors in a way that we will be able to see them while continuing to keep them plunged in darkness. We've all seen movies that have dark scenes that are supposed to be scary, and they are, but they're also frustrating because we can't see anything, we can't make out what's happening. But Marshall and his DP, Sam McCurdy, used minimal light sources here to brilliant effect. It stays dark, but not so much that we can't see anything. The action is remarkably clear, yet the oppressive, claustrophobic, creepy atmosphere is maintained and enhanced by the red light of flares and the green light of glow sticks, and lighters and headlamps serve both as functional equipment and spotlights to illuminate the actresses' faces. And then there's the video camera, which allows for some key night vision scenes. You know it's going to be good when a horror movie forces characters to rely on night vision. As for those characters, I like that there's only six, enough for variety, but not so many that they are just creature fodder. And yes, this is a very rare instance of a horror movie with an all-female cast. My mom and I didn't exactly relate to these women. They're bold, adventurous, athletic types who do risky things we would never do. And if ever I've had an insane moment where I thought spelunking might be a fun activity, this and 13 Lives have changed my mind. And I'm especially not interested if there's even the slightest chance some terrifying, bloodthirsty monstrosity is lurking down there. Ugh. All right, folks, that wraps up the third round. I hope you enjoyed this collection. As always, you can find the films listed in the description, along with information about how I watched them. And you are more than welcome to share your thoughts on any of the films I mentioned in the comments below. Thanks for watching.